In chapter six, we look at self-concept, identity, ethnicity, and gender. Self-concept and self-esteem. Our self is that part of ourselves, our personality of which we are aware. Self-concept is our conscious cognitive perception of ourself. Self-esteem is actually related to how we feel about ourselves. It's more evaluative in nature. Self-concept emerges in infancy and is when individuals see themselves as distinct from others. This is also termed as an existential self. Children eventually develop a categorical self, which actually adds together all the self-definitions across a number of domains and contexts. So we take into account who we think we are, who we think others think we are, who we think we will become, who we think others think we will become or want us to become. And so all of that becomes our total self. Why is having a good self-concept important? It provides motivation and direction. <clears throat> this is especially true when adolescents have positive views of their possible selves, their hoped for selves, their expected selves, and their feared selves. Strain said that we have four dimensions. Our basic self-concept, the overall self-concept. We have a transitory self-concept, which is, which is influenced by our mood. Social selves, which is what we think others see. And then our ideal self, which is what we would like to be. Then, in a newer study, uh, we have identified possible selves. Our hoped for self is who we wish to become. Expected self is who we will likely become. And our feared for self is who we dread to become. What determines self-esteem? The correspondence between our self-concept and our self-ideas. If there's a match, self-esteem is high. If there's a mismatch, self-esteem is low. It is important for parents to be accepting, flexible, and supportive. A number of consequences of low self-esteem have been identified. Teens with low self-esteem are at higher risk for depression, anxiety. They have poor social adjustment due, due to poor interpersonal confidence and lack of popularity. In the 80s, um, there was a study done on delinquency and how, um, how much self-esteem ties into delinquency. In this study, they came up with the self-enhancement thesis, which explains delinquency based on need for troubled youths to enhance their self-esteem through these deviant behaviors. A more recent study actually found that it's narcissism that predicted de delinquency more so than high self-esteem. Narcissism is a trait of being excessively vain and self-absorbed. <clears throat> Development of a positive self-concept. What factors influence self-esteem? Positive and supportive interactions with significant others. Girls tend to have lower self-esteem than boys, and teens with physical disabilities or high levels of stress also tend to have lower self-esteem. Self-concept does stabilize during adolescence. Factors that affect adolescent self-esteem, we know that having successes, being recognized, being athletic, feeling attractive, having authoritative parents, all of those are associated with higher self-esteem. Having authoritarian or permissive parents, having academic failures, low socioeconomic status, uh, peer rejection, moving, all of those actually um, show a decreased self-esteem. Eric Erickson, you remember, um, believed that the major crisis of adolescence is finding identity. And so although identity begins to form during adolescence, it does continue into adulthood. Within this one crisis, Eric identified seven, Erickson identified seven central identity conflicts. Temporal perspective versus time confusion, self-certainty versus self-consciousness, Role experimentation versus role fixation, apprenticeship versus work paralysis, sexual polarization versus bisexual confusion, leadership and followership versus authority confusion, 
ideological commitment versus confusion values. All of those are conflicts within the identity conflict. James Marcia identified the identity status and he believed that there's two criteria that must be met before we can attain a mature identity. We must go through a crisis in which we have to choose between two alternatives or more than one alternative and then we have to make a commitment, an investment. So individuals who have not experienced a crisis are identity diffused. Individuals who have not experienced a crisis but have gone ahead and made the commitment are foreclosed. Individuals that are taking a time of delay before they make a commitment are in a moratorium. And then identity achievement is found when we go through both the crisis and the commitment. Components of identity. There's many subcomponents, including physical, sexual, social, vocational, moral, ideological, and psychological. All of these make up our total self. Understanding sex and gender. Sex and gender are not the same thing. Sex is biological and refers to our anatomy, being male or female, the body parts. Gender is a broader term that includes cultural norms and expectations. What determines biological sex? Our genes determine our biological sex. Hormones then drive development into a male or female during critical periods. There are different theories on gender development, one of those being the cognitive developmental theory. This one says that uh, we first begin with our biological sex, which is given, um, which we have at birth, and so typically gender is assigned based on us. We shape our self-perceptions as being boy or girl. Then we form a gender schema, which basically we learn our gender, learn things as boys or girls, and then select those things that fit within our gender schema. What are gender roles? Gender roles are behaviors that men and women are expected to engage in with different frequencies. In our culture, male gender roles tend to be characterized by masculinity, aggressiveness, strong, forceful, logical, unemotional. Female gender roles are characterized by femininity, which is submissive, sensitive, tender, sentimental, dependent, emotional. What shapes these roles? Family, peers, culture, societal norms, and media. The social learning theory actually takes the behaviorist approach and says that we learn our sex typed behavior through rewards, punishments, direct instruction, and modeling. What are relevant influences on gender identity? Well, sometimes as parents and teachers, we give differential treatment to boys and girls. Identification with the same-sex parent or an adult leads to the child adopting the values and behaviors associated with that gender. Sex-typed opportunities, such as sports or classes, shape a child's understanding of what boys do versus what girls do. Peers also play a role in illustrating that boys and girls are different. Gender stereotypes are harmful to the people being stereotyped as well as those doing the stereotyping. Finally, androgyny, which is, which is considered a mixing of male and female traits and roles. Uh, this is emerging as the ideal, um, basically combining those, those two traits of being male and female. The benefits of androgyny, especially when individuals are positively androgynous, meaning they possess a good number of adaptive masculine and feminine traits. Gender in adolescence. Gender intensification hypothesis states that children intensify their gender identification during adolescence by acting in a more gender stereotypical way and holding more stereotypical beliefs. This appears to be stronger for girls than boys, and it may actually limit the scope of identity development by narrowing one's focus on one set of gender roles.